Welcome to Game of Roses. This is Pace Case. This is Bachelor Clues, and today is Friday, which means this is This Week in Bachelor Nation. So much has been going on, Yay. Pace Case. I can't wait to talk about it with you. I mean, the state of the game is wild. Yes, this has been, in my opinion, one of the most volatile weeks in the off season that we have probably ever experienced in the history of Bachelor. Mm-hmm. Now, before I know before we get to that, however, we do have a bit of business. One, mm-hmm. we need those screeners. We need those screeners. We have some big plans Please coming up for give them to us <laughs> the upcoming season uh, twenty one of Bachelorette Jen Tran and. We want to be able to do some live events. In order to do that, we need to get screeners of the Monday shows that we can watch perhaps on Sunday to record a little bit early. So we are hoping, we are praying, we are speaking our wishes into the pit to hopefully get some screeners. Mm -hmm. And we should also let you know, this show is now on YouTube. Every episode. I should put it on my vision board. Screeners. That's the only thing on mine. It's just a giant word, screeners, written in my own blood. That's not true. Mm. But we hope we can get them. And <laughs> did Skabulian do it? <laughs> no. Not a drop of my blood is wasted on my cat. He drinks it all. Now, we also should mention to you, this entire show is on YouTube right now. If you want to check us out and see us in living color, please go to YouTube and search Game of Roses. We're on there. Um, with that said. We are in living color. <laughs> shall, we ju- shall we jump into this episode, Pace Case? Let's go. This is Game Game of Roses. Roses. State of the Game. We tease this up front, but we've got news, and this news is Joan Vassos. Joan Vassos. Joan Vassos has been announced as the new Golden Bachelorette. She was an early front runner in the Golden Bachelor before going out in 12th place after a gut-wrenching self-elimination so she could return home and help her daughter who had just given birth to a new baby. Kind of a sabbatical, a golden yeah. version of a sabbatical in this case. And she's an interesting choice, and we'll get to the the FEMA of it all momentarily, but she's an interesting choice because technically, this is the worst finish for a bachelorette ever in at least the bachelorette history to then become a crown. Uh, she beat out Katie Thurston, who finished 11th place in Matt James's season 25, who also beat out Hannah Brown's seventh place finish in Colton Underwood's Bachelor season 23, which at the time, that was the first uh, bachelorette in history outside the top four to ever wear the crown. There have been a few bachelors outside of that, but not ever a bachelorette. So. Is she the real underdog? Uh, No. Isn't that? Who was the real underdog? I don't remember who that was then. It was Clayton, Clayton and Rodney. Rodney. That's right. He stole it from Rodney. Now I yeah. remember. Um. But so what happened here? It, it mm-hmm. is a sh- you were guaranteeing me. You said pace case. I guarantee you, Leslie Fema is the golden crown. Yeah. I was so excited. You know, a Minneapolis person. I'm kind of like adopted into Minneapolis mm-hmm. in some ways. Some people are saying. Oh. Um. Pr- so pretty disappointed to not have Fema doing it. Yeah. But am I surprised? No. Well, I re- absolutely not. She's. She's literally Trista. It's who I thought they would pick. Yeah. Uh, for this role, someone who is white and blonde and beautiful and just kind of, um, you know, a safer choice, some might say. Yeah. I mean, I remember in early in the season when she self eliminated, we both were predicting that they were going to select her. And then everything happened with Leslie Fema that happened. Mm-hmm. And she seemed like the, the odds favorite to become the Golden Bachelorette. I don't know exactly what happened. My belief is, and I, this is a belief only, I wouldn't call it conjecture exactly because it may be based on things here and there, but it's my belief. I have no corroborated evidence to back up what I'm about to say. But it's my belief that 
Fatima was offered the crown in much the same way uh, Maria was, in much the same way that Daisy was. And for one reason or another, she either rejected it or um, they came to some kind of impasse with production and she wasn't able to fulfill the wearing of that crown. I don't know why or what the details behind the scenes were, but I, my belief is that's what happened here. I just don't know why they would have held out this long. The reason they're announcing it, by the way, is because ABC and all networks had their upfronts this week where they have to reveal to the public and more importantly to the ad mm. buyers what their full season is going to be, what their upcoming lineup is going to be, what are the new shows, what are the returning shows. And we'll get to a little bit in the news about a show that's not returning, uh, which we also predicted. But in announcing, The Golden Bachelorette is going to be, I believe it's airing on Wednesday nights, and I believe it's an hour and a half long episodes as well. So that's a little uh, different. Interesting. Yeah. So they're kind of giving them, it's a slightly bigger order mm -hmm. if you're doing it an hour and a half than Golden Bachelor was. When I, Wednesday is it. interesting. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'll, I'll go with you there. I'm not sure why that is exactly, um, but they're doing it. You know what I thought of hmm. as soon as I heard this announcement? Uh, the Dark Emperor Fleiss quote where it was, I don't, I don't know exactly what this was, but it was his vision of the Bachelorette poster mm -hmm. was Trista laying on her side, yeah, as just kind of like this bombshell type person who's like, you know, not gonna, it's, it's not gonna ruffle any feathers. It's going to be like, in my mind, it is what is your safest option. Mm -hmm. I think that, um. I think that they believe widow a widow is a safer option than a twice divorcee in Leslie Fema. I would say that is a factor. I'm curious whether Leslie Fema's Jewish heritage has anything to do with this. Hmm. Just, I don't know. I just have had all these thoughts in my conjecture town about why this happened. Yeah, I think um, you're- Especially given your confidence. I think you're right about the divorce of this all. And I think that because of the golden mm. divorce, they can't go back to that. You know what I mean? Gary Turner and Teresa Ness destroyed season one, uh, destroyed the uh, integrity of it by getting divorced, proving that that- You think it's the stain on love that changed this? Well, a stain on divorce or divorce being a stain on love. And I think you're right. FEMA has been divorced. Mm. Therefore, there's more associated with her backstory with uh, Gary Turner and Teresa Nist, which in my opinion, again, has proven the process invalid, which they cannot now do again. As you're saying, they need their Trista. That has to be Vasos. And mm -hmm. I agree with you, a widow is a more compelling or more sympathetic story than is divorce, No, just at its face. I don't know the circumstances of any of these things. And yeah. I'm not saying- To be clear, this is all what I think are the bachelor- yeah decision makers opinions these are not my opinions at all exactly i think joan will Same be here. fantastic i think anybody from that season i mean really it's a i think a circumstance that's very similar to what bachelor season 28 was anybody in the top 10 is going to be a great lead they could have picked yeah. literally anyone and you're seeing that the that's what that season was yeah gary's season was about the women yeah totally period and i think that a lot of them that I mean that that was the effect of that season was I wanted to see a golden bachelorette of yeah. each one of those characters. Absolutely. I agree. Um and that PTC, it was just so for TRR, her leaving, and also she had the vibe of a front runner mm -hmm. when she was leaving. So it was like, oh, yeah. what could have been? And time it's kind of like when that that player left uh Matt James's season, who was so good. Mm -hmm. It to me. De definitely um, uh the time cut short element of it is something that they have honored here and there in Bachelor when, for whatever reason, a, a circumstance beyond your control, you have to leave the game early. I always think back to Desiree Hartsock, who became Bachelorette after essentially getting an Adams Family elimination from her brother, Cully, <laughs> then Bachelor Sean Lowe, a playboy. I think you're a playboy. Remember this? So... <laughs> remember it how could i forget <laughs> you're like remember it i watch that's it every on night. the uh deathbed me too montage me too 
you're a playboy. But I think Joan Vasos hits that category of time cut short for circumstances beyond her control. And therefore, Mm -hmm. she is now being given this second chance. Circumstances beyond her control that are also related to what a good mom she is, theoretically. Yeah, that that too. That's a big piece of this too. But let's move on to talk about... uh, Wait. Yeah. Sorry, one other thing. Here's why I am so excited about Joan being the Golden Bachelorette is the content. The Golden Players, we were wondering, are they going to become influencers? Yeah. Is it going to have the same effect as the main game? To me, Joan was one of the standout players in terms of her TikTok content. She was mastering. She knows how to do (laughs) effects that I don't know how to do. And, you know, I'm basically Gen Z. (laughs) Me too. Like such a young millennial. Look at this bucket hat. I'm I'm a young Gen X. (laughs) That's Gen Z, right? Young Gen X. Such a young Gen X. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate that. You're basically a mid range millennial in my mind. Oh, interesting. I'll take it. Um, You know, touch the 1900s, but barely. (laughs) Barely. I was just a baby. I was born in 1976. (laughs) That makes me a very old millennial. All right. So, okay. So, yeah, you got the glass corridor in there. At the time of the Golden Bachelor announcement, Joan Vasos had. 30.9K followers on Instagram and 39.7K on TikTok. Since then, she has risen to 38.9K on Instagram, gaining 8,000 essentially, and 40.6K on TikTok, gaining roughly 1,000. But she's doing better on TikTok than she is Instagram, which I find pretty interesting. Let's go. Yeah. She is a golden bachelorette for Gen Z. (laughs) Something like this. Now, is I mean, wouldn't you say there is a generational divide on the social media? You know, it's like my rough estimate is it's like Gen X, Facebook, Millennials, Instagram, Gen Z, TikTok. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the way it's shaping out. It's seeming like every generation is getting their own social media platform on which they can express themselves, communicate, et cetera, et cetera. Who knows what what will be around for Gen Alpha with the advent of AI creating whole new social media platforms almost on a daily basis. Should be interesting to watch. But yes, I I kind of agree with you. I think that's the commonly held belief that these platforms, each one exists for a generation. And I would even say Facebook is is not even Gen X. I would say Facebook is more Boomer. Boomer? Yeah. Uh, Gen X? Well, maybe Joan will be a, maybe she'll be, she'll transcend generation. Yeah. And she'll transcend, she'll be a three platform player. Possibly. That's great. That's like a a five-tool baseball player. You know, a lot of people Mm -hmm. call Gen X the lost generation or the forgotten generation because numbers-wise, we're the smallest generation. There are more boomers than us, and there are more millennials than us. There are certainly more Gen Z than us, Mm. and therefore, nothing was ever really marketed to us. Why what? Why are there fewer? Uh, That I don't know. People didn't like to procreate as much in, in that time period. I don't know. But um, we didn't have a lot of products marketed to us. And we were very skeptical of things that were marketed to us. Our kind of um, antagonistic relationship with marketing is very well known. We we're like an apathetic generation that that stuff doesn't work on. So we've kind of been left out of the mix. And for that reason, I would say Gen X doesn't really have a platform. We're kind of on all of them. Mm-hmm. Um, nonetheless. Let's move on to discuss this, if I may. The guys of this mm-hmm. season. That is what I've really started to focus on now. So we know it's Joan Vasso. She's going to be the the quarterback, basically, of this season. Who are the guys that she's going to be playing with? And how does that, the fact that it's going to be guys, golden guys, factor into what this season will be like? I think there is... I think it's going to factor in a lot. I think yeah. it's way easier to cast Golden Bachelor than Golden Bachelorette. I agree. Just given some, you know, women tend to live longer, yeah. be healthier longer. Um, there are more single women in that age range mm. than men, I would imagine. I don't know the data, but that's got to be true. Yeah. And I'm, I'm curious, are they going to bring in any ringers? Will they bring back Kelsey Anderson's father? Yes. Your um, Sweetenham's 
parental player. You think he'll be in this season? One hundred percent, yes. And I, I mean, think in that case, there's your front runner. Yeah, I think they have strong the next Golden Bachelor. Um, I believe they have strong incentive to keep him in a long time too. Maybe to be the next Golden Bachelor, as you're saying. But at least I don't think they'll do what they did to like Matt James' mom on the first season of Golden Bachelor or Sweet Num's friend. I don't think they're going to night one them. I don't think they'll do they that to him. Better not. Yeah. I hated. I hated what they did to Patty. I agree. The disrespect. Let me ask you this question: Do you think that there are certain mm -hmm. kind of uh, social expectations of the guys that are different from the women, specifically? about financial well-being. Do you think that a man who is 65 or over is kind of expected to have, at least if you're on this show, to have accumulated a certain amount of money? A hundred percent. That is going to be a factor. I think it was a factor in Golden Bachelor. Yeah. And I, <laughs> I don't want to quote my friend's dad who told me this, but... He was telling me what he thought about Golden Bachelor. He's like, you know what that is? They're always they're looking for a nurse or a purse. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, the same is kind of true here. Um, I'm also kind of curious about, you know, there's there's a possibility, as as we know in uh, all the regular games, guys who are pro athletes or on the verge of becoming that. That's a very common theme across all seasons of Bachelorette in the guy player pool. We even have Jesse Palmer, mm -hmm. who's the current host, was an ex-NFL quarterback, Colton Underwood. Uh, oh, we're definitely going to have some ex-athletes. Right. So in that case, this isn't guys who almost made it like Colton Underwood and Tyler Cameron and Matt James and didn't make it. These are going to be guys who did play in these sports professionally, possibly, in a player pool, a second audience, of guys who watched them on TV. So you may have in this... Dane Blanton? I don't know about Dane Blanton, but he would be great. I don't. He may be married with kids. I don't know what his uh, relationship status married. is. He, of course, for those who don't know, Dane Blanton was... <laughs> for those who don't know. <laughs> well, some people may not. He was... Uh, in. No, I mean, I think no one will know. <laughs> oh. Well, for those who don't know, for everyone then, Dane Blanton was on the possible list of Bachelors for Bachelor Season 3, way back in, I believe, 2004. The guy who was selected for that season was Andrew Firestone, billed as the real millionaire in opposition to what was then Fox's first season of Joe Millionaire. Um, Dane Blanton was in that mix. And the first episode of that season three showed the guys who were kind of the finalists for Bachelor selection that year. Dane Blanton was a black guy who was an Olympic, I think, gold medalist beach volleyball, volleyball player. And he could have been the first black bachelor back in season three. Instead, it was Andrew Firestone. So I would love to see him get another shot at this franchise because I always wondered what would the franchise have been like had he been bachelor in that early, mm -hmm. early era of the game. So maybe we'll see something like that, but I don't know what level of sports celebrity we might see, but I think we're going to see one. I think that's something they want to do. I mean, they have never cast a bachelorette season that doesn't have any athletes you know i yeah. think it's just it's a staple and that's kind of like the male version of pageants you know mm -hmm. it kind of prepares you a little bit for this game i'm i'm hopeful that it will be a great crop of people for joan that it's going to make us feel as hopeful and believing in love as we did for Golden Bachelor. I'm hoping we get that feeling again. I didn't stop believing. <laughs> I did. I won't. <laughs> I never started believing. Let me ask you this. You compared her to Tristan. Oh, clues. <laughs> you compared her to Tristan Sutter. Do you think she's mm. going to deliver the same goods? Is she going to give us a marriage that lasts yes. 20 plus years with children? Probably not I the know children. Joan, she is, well, I don't think there will be more children, but I believe she will stay with her ring winner at least a year. Mm -hmm. They're they're going to make, I, I just know they're going to have to keep them together at least until the next Golden Bachelor. Yeah. I think that's going to be a huge focus for the producers. 
to at least be like, okay, there's some kind of proof of concept here after that big stain on love. Yeah. Um, Gary and, and T- Teresa breaking up. Will we have so fast? Will we have a forced televised wedding like we did with Gary and Teresa? If she's if if Joan wants it, mm. we'll see a wedding. Oh yeah. Does it truly matter? For her to be married to this guy, I know that in the early days of Bachelor, hmm. they needed a season to work out to prove the process. Even though this is golden, yeah. and that's a a new version of this within the franchise. The franchise has been around for however twenty two years, and some people have gotten married a handful, most of them not. Do we care about the proof of process anymore? Does Joan really have to get married? I will still watch another season of Golden Bachelor or Bachelorette or whatever they throw in front of me, whether she gets married or not. You know, sometimes it's hard for me to put myself in the mind of a civilian, you know, because I'm like, oh, yeah, I'll watch literally anything they ever make forever. Mm -hmm. I am trapped here. Uh, (laughs) But I don't think they need the proof of concept that they did with Trista. Mm. Because guess what? Trista was in an era where this literally had never happened before. Yeah. Um, and dating shows in general seemed like like a joke. It was ex- so experimental. And now that we have, you know, literally just reality TV heaven right now. I know. So many different dating shows, so many different types. I think people are so much more used to the format that they don't need. They don't need that marriage success story. I think they'll get it. I do too. Um, maybe John. Yeah. Well, we'll see. But I don't think it has to be John. We will see. But that's the state of the game. Joan Vassos is your first Golden Bachelorette. It has been announced. That show is going to air later this year, probably at the end of the summer, I would guess, beginning of the fall, um, as it did last year, with no paradise. I can't wait. Which we'll get to in news. But first, let's move well, on. Yes, and I, I, that's another reason I think Joan will stay with her ring winner is she is an influencer. She knows what's what. She knows what to do, I think, more than um, Gary did. Hmm. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. She also didn't get to uh, be immersed in the situation as long. You know, there. I think there is a weird undercurrent mm-hmm. in the players of Golden Bachelor. Some of them seem to be kind of against the show or against Gary a little bit. And those are generally speaking. I mean, we should talk about the Ellen post, right? Sure. Ellen Goltzer posted in reaction to this. Well, we don't know what it's in reaction to. She posted an Instagram post. It is a black image with a red heart written on it. And it says in text, don't be a woman that needs a man. Be a woman a man needs. And the caption reads, believe in yourself and it will happen heart emoji. And some people were wondering, what does this mean? Yeah. Did it mean that she was up for it and is disappointed? Does it mean... I don't know. She doesn't... But that post came out on the day of the announcement. So it seemed linked in some way. It seemed to comment on the entire Mm -hmm. process of The Bachelor or Golden Bachelor in one way or another. I don't know exactly what it was, but I do think there is this undercurrent of players from Golden Bachelor who are kind of against the franchise now that maybe don't want to be a part of it or see it as somehow bad or fake hmm. because there have been some some uh, rumblings about Gary just being on the show for clout, that he wanted to come on there to be famous and the producers knew it and they were covering it up and all this. So who knows? Hmm. Who knows? But that is in the mix. Interesting. I think... If you're a Golden Bachelor player right now who's not selected, you should be buddying up to Joan as much as possible. You want to get on that season, be the sisterhood that's supporting her for guest dates. I think we're guaranteed going to see Trista. 100%. Trista's on every Golden season from here until there's a new Trista, which is never. I mean, I think she's got that job locked if she wants it. Yeah. All right. Well, let's well, let's move on, Pace Case. I hope that the I hope that the pit is excited about this choice as we are. Yeah, I definitely because I know there's been, you know, some kerfuffles lately where you think someone's gonna be it and then they're not. Clues promised me. Yeah. And he was wrong. And I'm it's fine. 
I don't know if I was exactly wrong. I think there's a version of this where Leslie Fema <laughs> was the golden bachelorette, just like Maria was the bachelorette, okay. and some things fell apart. I, I don't have any evidence to that end. I just have a feeling, and my feelings are usually right about these things. If I ever do get any evidence. Maybe Joan promised she would move to wherever the person is from. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because I do think that is a big problem with the show. I do too. I Obviously, that supposedly is why the golden divorce happened, because they couldn't reconcile moving to be with one another. Now let's move on to the next portion of our program, where we talk about the things we're watching outside of The Bachelor during this off season. This is... What are you watching? What are you watching? Case Case, what are you watching this week? Oh, so much. What a good week for me. <laughs> I <laughs> Okay. I, I stopped myself from bringing this up during State of the Game, but I've been watching Survivor oh. season 45. Okay. So it's the second to most recent season. And there is a player, this isn't a spoiler, he's it's just in the cast, mm-hmm. but he got knocked out in the first challenge of a previous season. Mm-hmm. And like had to be airlifted out. Well, and so he gets like a second chance this season. What was the challenge? Uh, but big target on his back. I don't know. They were like crawling under like wood posts or something, and he hit his head, and it was like bloody and stuff. Oh my god. Um, yeah. So that's what I was thinking when you were talking about Joan uh, <laughs> leaving early. You know, for a thing yeah. that's outside themselves. Right. I mean, kind of. This was Bruce's. I mean, it, you know, it's an accident. Sure. Um, but really enjoying watching that show. And like, it's so interesting after Traders, because Traders is not used to this, hi- having this history mm-hmm. of people being like game players and like lying. Like, lying is such a big part of Survivor. Sure. Um, I love it. And I'm probably going to chug through 45 and 46 now and i also did a new vanderpump rules palapa episode Ah. four from this season okay sandoval does a cold plunge as billy lee chants at him with wide-eyed affirmations (laughs) at a spa (laughs) okay and tom shorts tries to convince the more neutral scandoval victims to go easier on tom Mm. and i also cried when james gets reunited with his doodle uh, so just trigger warning on that. Summer House, I caught up. I have always loved this show. It's on Bravo, but this season mm. is as good as one of the OG seasons, I would say. You're essentially watching the slow destruction of uh, Lindsay and Carl's relationship, okay? which is an interesting um, kind of documentary. Mm-hmm. I rewatched the end of Shogun. Okay. Sobbed again at that. Gorgeous show. Mm-hmm. Uh, we just finished covering that on HBO Lax, and we're doing some pilots right now. We just did Gilmore Girls, which is, which shockingly holds up that pilot. I know, it's pretty strong. That was a good show. It was a very strong show. Oh, it was amazing. Yeah. Um, the acting is just ugh, the 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 grandma is just the best actor ever. Mm-hmm. I'm like, that is my grandma. Uh. Next up, we have House of the Dragon season two, June sixteenth. That's when that comes back. It's my so. birthday. Oh yeah, happy birthday! Thank you. We're gonna be on our vacation during that time, but and I have a dragon tattoo. Does that mean anything? It means you're a <laughs> cool guy. Gen X with a dragon tattoo. I'm the guy with the dragon tattoo. Those are all great shows, Pace Case. I'm glad that you had a good week of viewing. I, know. I have recently begun a show that I've wanted to start for a long time and never had cause to. Um, and so I just said, I'm doing it. It's called what show? The Outlander. Or maybe it's just called Outlander. Oh, I thought you were going to say Matchmaker. <laughs> no, I started that one a while back. Do you know Outlander, what it is? Yes, I read the book. Oh. The first book. Okay. I tried to watch the show. Mm-hmm. Um. I remember when my mom gave me the book, I was a kid, and then there was there was sex scenes in it, and I was like, oh my God, I, know. I don't know if my mom knew about this. Right. It's in the pilot, too, <laughs> right off the bat. It's You're sexy. like, oh, okay. There's nudity in this? Everybody's having sex? The show, for those mm-hmm. who don't know, 
is about a woman and a man who are a married couple that were in the military in England during World War II. And it's just post World War, World War II. They rotate back to civilian life and they're trying to reconnect after having been apart at war in their various capacities. She was a, a medic on the battlefield and he was like a army intelligence officer. So they take a trip to the Scottish Highlands where he is going to do some genealogy research into his family history. And his family has a bunch of red coats in it. He, these uh, English army guys who basically wiped out mm. all the Scottish uh, land kings of that era. And so they're on this little tour to the Scottish Highlands. Uh, they witness a pagan ritual at this kind of like Stonehenge, like standing stones of Craig Nadoon. And then she touches a stone. Okay, DLC. Exactly. And she is teleported back in time 200 years where she is now a prisoner who becomes kind of a, a medic for these Scottish rebels who are fighting against the very red coat ancestors of her husband 200 years in the future. And she has to keep this a secret so they don't think she's a witch, et cetera, et cetera. She begins to fall in love with, of course, one of the guys love who are triangle. her captors. Uh, the actor that plays her husband also plays his own ancestor, who is like a bad guy at 200 years in the future or in the past. Sorry. I love that. And the whole show, the whole show is shot beautifully in the Scottish Highlands, in Scottish castles with everybody in the show, just the thickest Scottish accents with... Uh, age appropriate or time appropriate colloquialisms and stuff, little slang mm. terms and stuff that these people are using. I absolutely love it. I love the Scottish accent now because of wow. Alan coming in traders. And now I get to watch a whole show of it basically. And I just started, there's six seasons of this thing. I can't wait. <laughs> I love it. I absolutely love it. I definitely didn't think you were going to say Outlander. Yeah. I would say this is like probably... I would imagine a very female audience. Um, oh, for, for sure. Because it's very like from the woman's POV yeah. and very sexy. She's the main character. Um, that's mostly what I remember is it's super horny. and Yeah, there's nudity uh, in every episode. Mainly her. It's mainly the main character is, is giving you nice. nudity in almost every episode so far. I'm only like three or four episodes in, but I love it. And then I've also been watching some anime. Speaking of that, that... I want to rewatch Girls. <laughs> Speaking of nudity in almost every episode. Fair enough. Um, wait, you're watching some anime? I'm watching some anime. Kaiju number eight on Crunchyroll. Love it. Uh, Mashley, Muscles and Magic, mm. which is a great, funny anime that's kind of set in a Harry Potter world where everybody has magic at this magic school except one kid who has trained his body physically to be so hard that he can beat magic by punching it and stuff. <laughs> Highly recommend it. It's very funny. <laughs> and then recently I watched uh, an old movie from 1995. Like Dune. Well, no, he has magic powers in that. Oh. The weirding way. Um, I, well, I just meant you complaining about his how he wasn't the body that you wanted. It has nothing to do with Timothy Chalamet's body. His body's fine. Timothy Chalamet has a fine body. He just doesn't carry himself in the manner of a martial arts expert who can kick anyone's ass, in my opinion. But that was the whole, like, whatever. Okay. Stop fighting about Dune. <laughs> I also have recently watched. I got to see Challengers again. Speaking of uh, sexiness, mm -hmm. that movie. Good Lord. Have you seen it yet? No. Ugh. I, that, I have a Challenger scream. I just bought a t-shirt that uh, all of the characters wear in it. <laughs> You got influenced by Zendaya, by a Zendaya movie, I, not even a social media post. Uh, it says, um, I told you. Yeah. Makes you think. Okay. Well. Anyway. Let's move on, shall love we? Love to hear what you're watching. Yeah. It's always fun. During the off season, you got to keep yourself busy when there's not 200 hours of Bachelor content to watch. So we fill it with other content. Now, speaking of other content. I mean, I'm also, sorry, I'm also catching up on you watching Traders. Oh, yeah. And I got to the point, Trader spoilers for one minute, season one. I got to the point where they pick Ari, and I was so excited. Yeah. I couldn't believe it. I know. Uh, That's what these... It was great, and he's great, and he accepts it, and uh, yeah. I'm proud of him. I agree. Um, let's move on. Shall we, Pace Case? There's only six people left, yes. 
Now we have to go to that portion of our program where we talk about all those tids that are fit to print. This is... Bachelor Nation News. First up in Bachelor Nation News, the $1.4 million man. We're talking about Jeremy Hartwell, one half of the UCAN Foundation. Oh. He just settled yes. with Netflix for $1.4 million. He filed a class action lawsuit against Netflix and the production entities behind Love is Blind back in 2022 over labor violations, including unpaid wages. And Netflix has agreed to settle for just under $1.4 million to be divided between attorneys and approximately 144 former cast and crew members. Hartwell's suit accused Kinetic of creating an unsafe and inhumane working conditions for the cast including by maintaining excessive control over virtually every aspect of the lives of their show's cast and exerting complete domination over their time, schedule, and their ability to eat, drink, and sleep and communicate with the outside world. Hartwell also claimed that Kinetic Content, the production company that created Love is Blind, misclassified its employees as independent contractors and denied paying them, quote, a proper minimum wage over t- and overtime pay or providing them a mealtime. Cast and crew were required to work 20 hours a day and seven days a week for $1,000 a week, effectively giving them a minimum wage of $7.14 per hour. The proposed settlement of $1,395,000 includes $488.25K for the plaintiff's attorneys, just over a third of the total award. Both figures need to be approved by a superior court judge. A hearing on both the settlement and the class is scheduled for July. Hartwell is not the only former cast member to have sued Love is Blind. Season 5's Tran Dang, who was edited out of the show completely, sued another cast member for sexual assault, naming the production company as a co-defendant. Kinetic tried to force that dispute into arbitration, but that attempt was rebuffed. But last week, a Texas appellate court ruled that the production company was not liable for the sexual assault claims because the incident took place in Mexico. However, the company is still on the hook for other claims, including false imprisonment and negligence. Another player from the same season, Renee Poche, has sought legal action against Kinetic after claiming she fell in love with another cast member who turned out to be homeless and a violent drug addict. She said the producers pressured her into continuing the romance all the way up to the wedding altar, where she abruptly changed her mind and said, I don't. In March, a judge ruled that Poche was bound by her contract to work out her dispute in arbitration. So what does this mean, Pace Case? $1.4 million settlement. I was going to ask you. (laughs) Arbitration. Yeah. Just Just this term. This means that you're discussing it, but it's all off the record. Uh, and you're trying to settle it? Basically, if you go to a settlement, now the settlement can include a variety of things. You can get, uh, generally speaking, what's called a stipulated judgment, where part of the settlement is the uh, defendant will enter in some kind of agreement that gets a judge to rule on the case, to say you were guilty or to admit some kind of wrongdoing. However, that doesn't necessarily set legal precedent. So this settlement that Hartwell got from Netflix doesn't necessarily mean it's going to change the way they write contracts or do anything. I would Mm -hmm. guess that it will change what they classify the uh, actors as or the the players in the games. I don't think they'll claim them for tax purposes as employees anymore. They will be moved to independent Mm -hmm. contractors on their tax forms so that they don't have to deal with this anymore. But nothing here, at least from my estimation of it, means that they're going to change the way they make these shows in any way other than that small classification, because that's primarily what the settlement was for, that it was the money they were being Mm -hmm. paid wasn't commensurate with the idea that they were actually full-time employees, which is what Netflix filed them under in their taxes. So I don't know. I don't think this means anything ultimately other than uh, a good payday for Hartwell and the other... I mean, but whatever, it's split amongst 144 people and a third of it's going to yeah. legal fees. It's not like this is going to change anyone's life, but it makes a good headline. It's not going to change anyone's life, but it is a win against them, yeah. which, you know, hasn't happened. And I and I would argue that 
just because it didn't require them to change any practices doesn't mean that they won't change them because of this. I think they might want to they might want to avoid these things in the future and if all that it requires is building in like food breaks and bathroom breaks and like whatever yeah. having a check-in time with your outside people or more mental health, you know, I think the demands are are pretty reasonable, and I think. Of course. I don't know. Maybe I'm just opto 2024. <laughs> I'm hoping that I'm hoping this will change things. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see what happens in the next season of Love Is Blind, or if any lawsuits come out of season six. Any more lawsuits come out of season six? I should say. But let's move on. Mm -hmm. Our next item. Yeah, the Renee Pochet one is extremely disturbing. I agree. Let's move on to lighter fare. Nicole Richie and Paris Hilton are not going to be in Traders season three. Two, Dang it. I know. I I'm so mad about this. You have no idea. I got tricked by this. The two. I know. You told me. Founding. <laughs> yeah. As fact. I posted it on my Instagram stories. And then when I found out it was no, false, I was. Oh, you posted it. No. I rarely <laughs> delete you. an Instagram story, but I had to do it here. The two founding mothers of modern reality TV appeared in an NBC promo spoofing the traders that debuted during the network's 2024 upfront presentation at Radio City Music Hall in New York City on Monday of this week, leading some to believe that they might actually be in the cast of the third season. Some is me. I was among the some. Mm -hmm. Me too. I am some. Alas, it was all clever marketing for their upcoming Peacock show that will seemingly be a reboot of their show that started it all with five glorious seasons back in 2003, The Simple Life. Also making an appearance in this fake video that fooled the nation were Jax Taylor, Teresa Giudici, Kenya Moore, Joe Manganiello, Howie Mandel, Javier Poza, Matt Iceman, Kristen Kish and Holly Robinson P and her husband, Rodney, as Alan Cumming joked about all of them bombing their auditions uh, for the traders, ultimately saying that they failed. And then he added, the good news is, I can't do a very good Alan Cumming. I'm going to work on it. But he says, no, keep trying. The good news is that all of them will, of course, be great in their own juicy, unscripted goodies coming to NBC Universal including some new faces and places to fill the unquenchable thirst for reality television deep in our souls. That was so good. It's because I'm watching Especially goodies. Outlander. You nailed it. It's Outlander. Wow. <laughs> the, <laughs> the third season of The Traders U.S. is currently in production. Although release dates have yet to be announced, the first two seasons premiered in January 2023 and 2024. Can't wait. I also heard rumors that Kenya and um, who was it? One of the Roni girls was going to be on this season. I, so I'm yeah. like, is it fully false? I don't know. I've heard that too. There have been no official announcements. Dorinda. But yeah, I've seen those same things you're talking about. I don't know. And Jax Taylor is certainly on my dream traders list. Yeah. We'll see. Speaking of shows getting announced, one show was missing from ABC's fall schedule this week. Mm. Bachelor in Paradise. This is traditionally the moment when ABC unveils Paradise's renewal and its time slot in the upcoming summer season. But the Bachelor All-Star show was nowhere to be found. Although a formal cancellation has not been announced, it looks very much like there will be no season 10, at least this year. The possibility of its return to ABC's schedule in 2025 isn't being ruled out, but this is certainly not a good sign for Paradise. It's not a good sign, but is it actually a good sign? No. <laughs> because they're going to skip a year, and that allows you to do a rebrand. No. And you come back, guns blazing. Mm -hmm. You got all the all-stars all yeah. from two years worth on sand. No. I think... No, it's... Well, we need to read this, this next news item. Don't you dare. Because the next okay. news item, I believe, is what most would consider the nail in the coffin. That nail in the coffin is... Making matters worse for Paradise, our next piece of Bachelor Nation news deals directly with Paradise's biggest competitor... Perfect match. 
Not only was the Perfect Match Season 2 release date announced this week, so too was the entire cast, along with their Instagram handles on the official Netflix entertainment site, Tadum. The second season of Netflix's all-star dating game format will premiere June 7th, with the rules established in Season 1 governing the game once again. Singles will pair off to compete in a series of compatibility challenges under the watchful eye of one half of the hosts of Love is Blind, <laughs> a solo Nick Lachey, <laughs> who some people are tossing and some people are keeping in the mix if you were playing F. Mary Kill. Yeah. The winning couple will then have the power to bring one or two fresh faces back into the villa, wreaking potential havoc on the situationships already in progress. Now- Netflix did this correctly with this cast announcement. It's on their official website, it has pictures of them. It tells you what shows they came from and links to their Instagram. Mm -hmm. You simply don't see Bachelor doing anything like this. I want to read through this whole list and you tell me what this means for Paradise. You've got okay. a Laura Teneri from Dated and Related Season 1, 165K Instagram. Britton Bird, Too Hot to Handle Season 4, 403K Instagram. Brighton Constantine, Squid Game Challenge Season 1, 72.6K Instagram. Dom Gabriel, The Mole Season 1, Perfect Match Season 1, 637K Instagram. Dominique Defoe, Too Hot to Handle Season 4, 125K Instagram. Chris Hahn, Dated and Related Season 1, 92.9K Christine O'Banner, Too Hot to Handle Season 5, 349K. Elise Hutchinson, Too Hot to Handle Season 5, 419K. Let me clear my throat for this next one. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Harry Jowsey, Too Hot to Handle Season 1, 4.2 million Instagram followers. No one in Bachelor Nation comes close to this. He absolutely mm-hmm. dominates the entire nation. And he's in this show. Holly Scarfone, Too Hot to Handle Season 3, 802K. Izzy Zapata, Love is Blind Season 5, 203K. Jake Cunningham, The Ultimatum Season 1, 210K. Jess Vestal, Love is Blind Season 6, 958K. We'll definitely be over a million after this uh, season airs. God. Justin Asada, Surviving Paradise Season 1, 17.9K. Kaz Bishop, Dated and Related Season 1, 70.5. Melinda Berry, Too Hot to Handle Season 2, Dated and Related Season 1, 1 million. Uh, Michael Lussier, Love is Blind Season 5, 368K. Nigel Jones, Too Hot to Handle Season 4, 106K. Steven Ditter, Too Hot to Handle Season 3, 223K. Tolu Ekandari, The Trust Season 1, 22.9K. Trevor Sova, Love is Blind Season 6. IG disabled for reasons we all <laughs> remember. <laughs> he was the guy who got raked over the coals for having a girlfriend coming in. And then... Still disabled. Yeah. At least the, the from my research, I couldn't find it. Xanthi... I'm going to butcher this last name. My apologies. Parody Comedis, The Circle Season 565K. With the talent pulled this deep. What does this tell me? It tells me I need to watch Dated and Related? What <laughs> is this? <laughs> I don't know if you do or not. And also, are some of these people still related? Like, they can't stop dating people they're related to? I mean, this is what you see in Bachelor 2. Once you get into that Netflix singles pool, you want to remain single and you want to go on these other shows. And this is what's mm-hmm. happening. I, I absolutely no, this is love a, it. An incredible cast. Yeah, it's insane. And I just don't think I don't think Paradise comes back from this. They're gonna take a year off, and this is what Netflix is doing. Okay, you take the year off. We've got Harry Jowsey and Jess Vestal making out in the ocean. You're done. There's nothing that will compete with this. They now, yeah. in my opinion, perfect match season two is going to dominate the dating all-star show arena. And that's it. Now, Paradise, even if it does come back, will be Pepsi to to Netflix's Coke. Just Harry Jowsey alone. Yes. Is like all you need. You and I think in that way Francesca did that um in season one where you have such star power that it doesn't even matter anything else. And now he has this platform where he's one of the Call Her Daddy podcasts he's going to be able to promote it on. Yep. He's going to be promoting it on Call Her Daddy. Like, yeah. it's going to explode. I agree. Um, I don't know how Izzy Zapata got on, but... <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Sorry. Whoa. <laughs> Sorry, Izzy. I think you're going to do great, Izzy. I can't wait to watch you. Uh, no, he's probably on because Micah's on, right? Yeah. They're... Oh, wait. Yeah. 
They need some Love is Blind representation. Because uh, Micah, yeah, Micah is so good. Um, I can't wait. I can't wait to watch. Same. OMG. With a talent pool this deep and open and very good promotion of their Instagrams and Paradise taking a year off. Did you read this already? <laughs> it's quite possible. Let's just move on to our final news piece show. The writing's on the wall. It only took two seasons for Perfect Match to destroy Paradise. It does look that way. And also promoting them with their Instagram handles before the season. Yeah. It's, it's so basic, but it's something Bachelor can't do. I, it's not that they can't do it. It's that they refuse. They still have this idea, this attitude that social media is contradictory yeah, to reality TV to do instead of being in lockstep with it. They are the same thing. They are a part of one entity now. It is how you manufacture celebrity and they need their players to become celebrities. That's how these shows survive. That's how franchises survive. At any rate, I could go on for an hour about this, but we have one more uh, piece of news to get to. Mm -hmm. Finally, in Bachelor Nation news. I assume you'll be covering it in Clue's Corner. Oh, every episode, as soon as it drops. I'm salivating to watch this. <laughs> Finally, in Bachelor Nation news, some new information has surfaced regarding the ongoing divorce proceedings between Rachel Lindsay and her estranged husband and ring winner from Bachelor at Season 13, Brian Abasolo. Court filings regarding Abasolo's finances that were required to establish his claim to some of Lindsay's wealth reveal a low four-figure monthly income around $1,600 per month. Abasolo also revealed he currently has a negative bank account balance. Whew. In the filing, the 43-year-old chiropractor listed himself as self-employed, earning $1,341 per month from his job and another $330 in rental property income. He said his income from his self-employment is negative $571 per month with $781K in real and personal property, but little to no funds in the bank. In the filing, he said Lindsay lives with him and pays some of his monthly expenses, which total 18.9K, 6.5K in rent, 1.5K in groceries, $500 on clothes, $250 on laundry, $5,000 for his savings, and various other bills. He owes 245K in student loans and another 2K in credit card debt. Both amounts are currently deferred. Abasolo has paid his divorce lawyer 6K and owes another 27K currently among his assets. He claims a home in North Hollywood and another in Miami, a Porsche McCann worth 51K, investment accounts with around 30K, gym equipment worth $500, his $1,000 wedding band, a watch worth $2,000, and an air fryer. Abasolo filed for divorce in January <laughs> after four years of marriage, citing irreconcilable differences. Abasolo demanded Lindsay pay him spousal support. We'll see if he gets it. But that's the news. She was like, I can't stand you valuing this air fryer so much. You care about your air fryer more than me. <laughs> <laughs> the air fryer is what, what ended them. We don't know what the ins and outs of the entire relationship were, but this was news that came out. Uh, Abasolo essentially laying bare his financial situation in order to try and lay claim on some of Lindsay's finances as well. Now, let's move on. Yeah. I know I saw a headline that she is saying she covers 90% of his expenses or something. Yeah. We don't know. We wish them both well, and we hope that it all turns out as mm -hmm. good as it can, and they both move on happy and healthy. Now let's move on to that portion of our program where we talk about all the plays our favorite players are making off the field and on their telephones. This is... The parasocial play, 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 play of the week. We had a pretty good week for parasocial plays. We had Mother's Day. We had uh, some a beautiful new friend group forming that is creating content. First up, we got free spirited and smooth around the edges <laughs> crown Gabby Windy posed for a two slide Instagram post holding a Polly Pocket shaped vibrator. Oh. Spawn con this week. Caption reads for the girlies, vibes on me. Silly tongue emoji. This one comes with a remote for all the women in STEM. Everyone who enters will win a toy or gift card towards a toy. Please follow the steps below accordingly and enjoy Sparkle Emoji. Click the link in my IG bio. Sparkle Emoji. Sign up with your email. Sparkle Emoji. See your gift from at Belzaco. Belzaco. 100% discreet shipping and billing and ships worldwide. Hashtag B Boutique. 
partner. Partner. We love to see the lovable dingbat getting great engagement postseason as well as supporting women in STEM. Anna Maddox, assistant to Ariana Maddox from Vanderpump Rules and Love Island, made a viral Duracell ad referencing the battery fight from the show and mentions not signing an NDA. The caption reads, quote, I buy my own batteries, too, and I prefer Duracell. They're different, and different is good. Winking face emoji, hashtag ad, hashtag Duracell. 39.4K likes, 2.2K comments, and 1.3 million views. This was huge engagement for the recurring character who only has 23K Instagram followers. Playing way above her it level might be here. the last season of Vanderpump, but she is thriving. Yeah. New friend group alert. Charity Lawson posted two gorgeous reels of the last three ring winner and crown pairs all on a group vacay in Hawaii. This is Katie, Zach, Dotton, Charity, Joey, Kelsey. In the first reel, they follow the looks like a cinnamon roll TikTok format, and they extracted 24.6K likes and 1 million views from the fourth audience. In the second reel, the exes and now besties drink cans, dance around, feed chickens, look cute, etc. with the caption, no BIP, no problem, dot, dot, dot. I bring you couples in paradise. Thank you at Kukiula, at Lodge <laughs> at Kukiula, for an incredible trip to Kauai. Grateful for the friendships we have built through an insane show and experience. Made some memories, met the friendliest people, and got a much-needed reset from life. This trip fed our souls. A uh, shaka emoji, wave emoji, orange heart emoji, hashtag travel, hashtag Kauai, hashtag Hawaii, hashtag bachelor, hashtag travelgram. It is so for TRR. Everyone is glowing throughout. We love to see... All the players filling this gap left by no BIP this year. 317K views for that last reel. I mean, all these players should be doing stuff like this now that there's not going to be a BIP. Take it into your own hands. Plan some kind of tropical vacations together. Go to a beach somewhere and just pump out the content. Make your own BIP. You have to do it for us. Yes. Just get an Airbnb. Maria and the twins and some others. Maria has to be there. They're not twins. I don't know why I keep calling them twins. You're talking about uh, Lauren sisters. and her sister, yeah. yeah. The Hollanders. Moving on. Abigail Herringer, the season 25 Thimp Rose recipient, and young Noah Herb made a joint play on Herringer's TikTok this week. A reel of their engagement photo shoot, including a couple stills to the song Adore You by Miley Cyrus. The caption reads, quote, Mr. and Mrs. Herb coming this fall. Goose emoji? Dove emoji. Dove emoji? Sorry. Goose. <laughs> I was like, is that? Is there a Crystal goose dove. emoji? There must be. The pair pose in a field celebrating animal husbandry style with the Bachelor's official creatures. Horses. The equine. 9.6K views. All of these were strong plays, but there can only be one winner. Our pair social play of the week goes to ring winner Kelsey Anderson. She made an extremely 4TRR TikTok this week in which she wishes a happy Mother's Day to families with mothers and families that have lost their mothers and encourages people to remember positive memories about the mothers who raised them, whether they are still here or not. She reflects on how she watched her free-spirited mom jump off a cliff into the sea and includes a video of her mom dancing, which extracted tear play from Pace Case. Wow. The caption reads, Happy Mother's Day. I hope y'all all find the love and joy today. Pink heart emoji, 476K views, 53.3K likes. Anderson crushed her season with her PTC play. And we love to see her continue to inspire and connect with her parasocial audience. Fantastic. I would congratulate her here, but I'm going to congratulate her here instead because these parasocial uh, plays were great, but we have one more. <laughs> That was a creature this week. We had some good creature play. But this week, the parasocial creature of the week goes to Joey Grazia Day and Kelsey Anderson when they attended the IF movie premiere and they are joined by a monstrously cute creature on the purple carpet. This creature that is standing behind them in this picture they took is the creature mm -hmm. voiced by, I believe, the office guy. Krasinski? No. John Krasinski? No, the guy from The Office, no. the main character. I don't know why I can't remember this Michael guy's Scott. name. Yeah, 
Who's the actor that plays that Carell. guy? Steve, Steve Carell. Carell. <laughs> that's the one. Um, oh. A very funny picture. I wonder if that's Steve Carell in this costume here. I'm going to say absolutely not. Probably not. But <laughs> it's a great photo. It's a big purple monster looking thing. It's so yeah. cute. It's great to see them out enjoying their celebrity with this in quotes creature. Congratulations <sighs> now. She's got a butterfly necklace on in it. To Kelsey Anderson. I can't. Now let's move on, Pace Case, to the final portion of our program where we delve deep into the bottom of the pit to issue forth our screams about how our fandom of this show and reality television generally has now not, uh, it, it has exceeded any normal means and it's become a part of who we are. This is Screams from the Pit. My scream is... An exaltation this week, oh. a scream of joy, because I had my 35th trip around our dying son this week, and I had a little birthday party, and my best friend Bachelor Clues came, <laughs> and he gave me what is one of the best birthday gifts I've ever gotten oh. And I'm pretty sure I probably tear played getting it. You did. Um, but it was a. Uh, I, <laughs> yeah. I, just, I chalked it up to. <laughs> Thank you, Keeper of the Memories. The various medicines you might have been taking that night. Oh my gosh. Every kind of medicine you can imagine. And I get this framed thing that is there's an image of our Gore logo in it. And it says our dates for our five year anniversary of Gore. And then. On either side is both of our original microphones yeah. that we used to record our first episode. I mean, it's the sweetest present I've ever gotten. I'm glad you liked it. It's so, it was so nice. And like, I don't know. This is just such a big part of my life and your life. And I was like, I got to really step it up in my Kringles for clues. I'm like, <laughs> I'm giving you like a squirrel dog toy. <laughs> First Kabulian. And he, he's like, terrified oh, of it, by the I way. I need to come up with something. Yeah, he will not engage in any kind of Congress with it. He avoids it at all costs. Really? I think he prefers his, um, what do you want to call them, targets, to be a little bigger. <laughs> oh, my gosh. What if you put it in a little costume or something? <laughs> yeah. Maybe then he'll Sure. I'll, I'll he'll like plump it, it up for I him. mean, I don't want Kabulian to destroy it anyway. That's fine. Yeah. Anyway, thank you for this gift clues it's my it pleasure it's beautiful and i'm so grateful for this weird journey we've done together <laughs> it's nothing if not weird and it gets weirder which brings me to my screen oh no <laughs> this week i decided something i've been looking at this product called the dji osmo 3 it's a little tiny uh -huh. vlogging camera and I want it because it's cool and it, it's very easy to use and you can choose stuff with it. But I'm like, what am I going to shoot with it? Why would I buy it? I don't have any cause to do it. You, you haven't been vlogging. No. And then it came to me. No. <laughs> it came to me in a fever dream. I should be out in the street asking people at the Grove what they think about certain Bachelor Nation news items. For example, what if I had this little device and I just start walking up to people at the Grove and saying, what do you think about Joan Vassos being announced as the first Golden Bachelorette? Set a record for most times banned from the Grove. <laughs> at two? You think two is the record? Come on. Somebody's got to have no, at least three. No. All I'm saying is I'm going to get this thing. You should ask people there about Joan. I will. I agree. Just get it. I think it, my primary use case for it will be this, to do man-on-the-street interviews about Bachelor Nation news with complete strangers at the Grove. And when that came to I was like, what could I use this camera for if I buy it? That'll do. That's the thing I should use. It's now my first inclination when I'm thinking about getting a new piece of technology mm -hmm. is how can I use that technology to further my fandom and understanding of The Bachelor. That's where I'm at now. That's a good scream. That's yeah. a pretty good scream. You could use it for, you know, you could shoot some music videos of Skabulian too. Sure. Um, I don't know. I'm sure there's other use cases. It doesn't have to be entirely a scream. Yeah. Well, we'll see. I think it's going to be me well, like, harassing people in the street about their knowledge of I Bachelor. can't wait for your man on the street videos. Yeah. Maybe I can do some videos where like, I'll give you a dollar if you can answer this trivia question correctly. 
who yes. did Trish Snyder interrupt on her fantasy suite date in the <laughs> fantasy suite episode of season five of The Stop. Bachelor in the first resurrection in Bachelor history? No, you don't ding, know ding, it's ding. Mandy, J. Mandy Jeffries. J. Jeffries. Exactly. All right. Uh, we have one more screen. I would like that. Miss, you do Billy on the street. Miss for a dollar, name a bachelor. Oh, that isn't bad. Something like this. I'm, I'm going to get this camera and I'm going to start doing these things. That's my screen. Now, are you going to be, you're going to be in the sun though? Are you going to be in a full cowl? Sun? Maybe, maybe I misheard or didn't hear correctly. I never said anything about doing this in the day. This is at night? Yeah. I mean, that's the only time I come out. <laughs> All right. I guess I should have assumed. <laughs> Let's move on. I just think man on the street interviews, you think of daytime, but. Maybe I'll be. Uh, sure. Uh, you could just sneak up on people at night. I'll be head to toe in a, <laughs> a cowl and sunglasses and, and full covering. That won't be terrifying. That'll to be what anyone. I get you. I'll get you a little parasol for your man on the street. Oh, perfect. Things. Or maybe one that's attached to a little backpack. Please. Just make sure it's uh, black. Kristen Bell had one like that on Good Place. Make sure it's black, please. Okay. Let's move on. Okay. Two. Our final scream. If you watch this program at all, if you listen to this program at all, you know other people are screaming. It's not just me and Pace Case. And if you would like to submit your very <laughs> own scream to our program, all you have to do is go to patreon.com slash game of roses. You join us in the bottom of the pit and you're going to get access to a wide variety of things. One of those things is our Discord. On that Discord is a channel where you can upload your screams and we play the best ones here. Are you ready to hear this scream, Pace Case? Let's go. Let's do it. What up, Pitt? So, I have a scream that's a bit of a throwback to Joey's most recent season. Two days ago, one of my coworkers arrived at work looking distraught. Now, we are not particularly close, but I do care about her, so I ask, is everything okay? And she immediately starts to cry and tells me about an awful fight she had just got in with her partner. Now, as if someone was controlling my hand from afar, I instinctively wet-thumbed the second tear from her eye. Not once in my entire life have I ever done this, but I simply could not hold back. This tear swipe was well-received, and she thanked and hugged me. And now, we are much closer. Praise be the pit. Wow. That's, huh. I don't know what to say. Your fandom of The Bachelor has overtaken your ability to control your own body physically, and you just now are compulsively wet-thumbing people. This is a high-level scream, and I love it. I hope that mm -hmm. the wet-thumb serves you well for the rest of your life. And although I don't like to see people crying because of traumatic or stressful situations, I would like you to get to wet-thumb other people. With a high level of frequency. <laughs> I'm torn. I know. it's Because I would like to see that. Me too. Please get it on video next time. I'm like, time. I never see people crying. And then I'm like, oh, just me. And I'm like, I guess I could wet thumb myself. Is this what I should use the camera for? Should I just walk around wet thumbing people at the Grove? You just, yeah, you just go, you got a little something there. Yeah. I just wait to, <laughs> I'm lurking around waiting for couples to get into fights so that I can wet thumb whoever cries. Someone will be crying. Yeah. You got to go somewhere where a lot of people are crying. I mean, I'm sure somebody cries at the Grove every day. I'm positive Ikea. of that. I almost cried at Ikea. That's my true scream. I mean, it has nothing to do with The Bachelor, but I didn't know what Ikea was. I Why? went there. I went there this uh, past week to get some stuff for the new studio that what I'm building out of my home. didn't know what Ikea was? I thought. I was under the impression that you go into Ikea and you write down the numbers of the stuff you want, and then you give those numbers to someone, you pay for those items, and then those items are delivered to your home. Uh-uh. It's a warehouse where you write down the numbers of the items, then you have to look them up on a computer, then you have to find them in a warehouse and yourself haul them off of giant shelves and put them on rolling carts that you're wheeling through a sea of other rolling carts and almost doing like a crash up derby with people until you get to the front where you finally then pay. Then you must wheel them to another place to have them delivered to your home. Did you go to Burbank? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I threw my back the last time I was there. <laughs> it was hell on earth. I'll never return. I'll never return. 
That's so. I can't believe you have never been to Ikea. That's where almost all of my furniture is from. Mm. Um, but I guess you're just um, bougie. No, it's just too far. There are furniture places that are way closer to my house than that. Mm. At any rate, thank you everyone for joining us today. That well, concludes our program. Sorry about that. Oh, for you. I'll be okay. Um, it's all in the name of the Congratulations to this person, though, for becoming closer mm. with their coworker. I mean, even if it's what you think might be gameplay, yeah. a STCO, shoulder to cry on, wet thumb, it's also empathetic king behavior. So That's true. It's like sometimes it can start as gameplay and then turn into friendship. That is true. And you know what I just realized? My Ikea scream is technically a real scream from the pit because I was there to purchase things for this little studio that I'm now building out to shoot our YouTube videos in. It looks great. Thank you. I mean, I could only see you in front of a wall with Alex Michelle's <laughs> portrait, but it looks good. The Alex Michelle portrait is and like, who is that man? Temporary. Eventually, what you see behind me will be bookshelves with a variety of bachelor paraphernalia and things of that nature. So we we got to find him because I I want to see his reaction when he sees your wall. I bet he doesn't think his pictures on anyone's wall. I'll give him that painting if he wants it. I designed that image myself. That said, thank you, everyone, for joining us this week. That concludes This Week in Bachelor Nation. We will be back next Tuesday with another episode and next Friday with another This Week in Bachelor Nation and the Monday after that with a Digging Deeper and next Tuesday with another episode and <laughs> next Friday. And we'll keep doing it forever. So we hope you'll join us. But no, we're taking a couple of weeks off in June. We're taking a, a kind of vacation. A little mini sabbatical. Kind of. I might still be around doing stuff. We'll have to wait and see if I get that. that yeah. My new However camera. However <laughs> we choose to vacation might be different, but. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> At any rate, thank you everyone for joining us. We will be back very soon. And before we go, as always, Pace Case, what is that dwab at? It's been 8,089 days without an Asian bachelor. Praise be Dark Lord Palmer. <laughs>